afternoon and welcome to the City Club's February program. Today's program is a result of efforts by two members of our program committee, Victoria Droper, Dorper, excuse me, and Executive Director of the Northwest Regional Council, and Don Keenan, the very hardworking chair of our program committee. Uh, neither Don nor Victoria are able to be here today, hence the need for going to the bench for the second string. But both are hoping you enjoy and benefit from today's program. <clears throat> Before introducing today's topic and panelists, a brief word about our March 28th meeting, which will consist of a panel of top law enforcement officers who will discuss how and why policing in today's world is substantially different from policing <clears throat> just 20 years ago. And we will announce our panelists as soon as they are all confirmed. <clears throat> now, for today's topic. It seems like every other day, or so, we read about a mentally ill person doing something that brings him or her to the attention of all of us. In September of 2008, a mentally ill person killed six people, including Skagit County Deputy Sheriff Ann Jackson, and wounded two just down the road in Alger. <clears throat> a year ago this month, a mentally ill person was shot and killed by a Whatcom County deputy and a Border Patrol agent near Linden. Two months ago, a mentally ill man constructed an elaborate guillotine and cut his own, off, his own arm off just a few blocks from here. Three weeks ago, <clears throat> a mentally ill man stabbed his grandmother to death in Kennewick and an hour later showed a stranger on a bus a cell phone picture of his bloody dead grandmother <clears throat> with a knife in her neck. We read things about, about this all the time or like this all the time, and often do not know what to think, or even how to think about issues like these. Luckily for us, there are those who not only know how to think about these issues, but know how to effectively deal with them. Our panelists have experience and insight related to the complex topic of mental illness, including information about services that are available in our community and how they can be accessed. And Deacon serves as Whatcom County's Human Services Manager. She is licensed as an independent clinical social worker and has over 40 years of experience working in the field of behavioral health. Her past roles include managing the state prison for offenders with mental illness, directing outpatient and residential clinics for mental health and chemical dependency treatment, and administering human services programs at the state and local level. She currently serves as the president of the state's Association of County Human Services. Our second panel, panelist, <clears throat> Dennis Dashio, is a lead employee assistance professional working for St. Joe's Peace Health Medical Center in a program that serves over 40,000 covered lives through 70 local employers. He is currently serving as vice president of the board for Whatcom Counseling and Psychiatric Clinic, one of the primary agencies serving the mental health needs of Whatcom County. Dennis is on the Behavioral Health Primary Care Integration Task Force Committee of the Whatcom Alliance for Health Care Access. And when he can find the time, he runs his own private practice as a therapist. Our format today consists <coughs> of a 15 minute or so presentation by each of our panelists, followed by our traditional question period for our badge wearing members. And our uh, Anne's going to start, and she'll have a microphone, and she will wander the room. And Dennis will be personing the uh, projector. So please, let's welcome Anne and Dennis to our program. Good afternoon. So we're going to provide you with two years of information in 30 minutes. So buckle up and take notes so we can answer the questions that we didn't answer as we presented. I wanted to tell you, first of all, I'm here as a public servant. I am a Whatcom County government employee, and I provided each of you with a binder with some information that I encourage you to take home with you. There are extras up at the front table. Please take as many as you like. Um, and I also brought extra brochures for our outpatient mental health treatment program that is designed to provide services to people who are uninsured in our county. So it's full of resources and information that I wanted you to know about. And so I will start. Um, here are a few facts, not fun facts. 
First of all, approximately one out of every five residents in Whatcom County will experience mental illness. People with serious mental illness die 25 years younger than those without. Pretty staggering. A few years ago, around 2005, the Bureau of Justice did a very comprehensive study and after that study estimated that up to 50% of the jail and prison populations have a mental illness. And the other sad thing is that addiction rates for those with mental illness is three times greater than those without. So, a serious problem and as you can see, a costly problem. What is mental illness? Basically, it's a condition or a disorder that disrupts a person's thinking, the way they make choices, the way they um, feel, their mood, how they interact with other people, um, how they function. Can they take a shower? Can they keep themselves fed? Categories of mental illness, there is a book about this thick that addresses every single one. I'm not gonna go through that today. <laughs> but what I'll do is tell you the general categories of the disorders that we're going to talk about today, which are really the most serious of all. You've all heard of psychotic disorders. Schizophrenia is the one you probably have heard about the most. You can tell that a person has a psychotic disorder because they have one or more of these conditions. Hallucinations as though thinking something is present that isn't, um, for instance, hearing voices that tell them to th do things that are not safe. Um, grandiose thought patterns, total distortion of who they think they are and what they're capable of. Delusions, uh, some of the things that Chuck was referring to in some of the horrible incidences. People had delusions and thinking that they, um, for whatever reason, often because of some uh, bigger authority, are telling them to do things that they shouldn't be doing, like cutting off an arm. Paranoia, very, very striking. And for those of you who may know somebody with paranoia, this is very serious because these people um, who experience this symptom are not likely to accept help. So it's very, very difficult because they don't trust you. And then mood disorders, bipolar disorder, manic depressive, you've probably heard that one. That's probably one of the biggest. Um, and depression is huge. And then Whatcom County, gets to have seasonal affective disorder. <laughs> Just not enough sun here. Take your vitamin D, okay. And then the other main ones, and this is the most prevalent in the United States, anxiety disorders, the whole category of anxiety disorders. Um, Post-traumatic stress, you've certainly heard that about in relationship to military veterans who've been in active duty. Phobias, unrealistic fears, things that um, so, for instance, I don't have a fear of public speaking, but I'm scared to death of technology, and I had to come really early to make sure <laughs> that everything was working. Um, my favorite phobia, uh, and this is a test now, tell me what this is, triskaidekaphobia. It is the fear of the number 13. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my favorite. And then obsessive compulsive disorder, to the extent, and again, remember the definition of mental illness that we're talking about today. It disrupts a person's daily functioning. This is a person who simply can't get through the day successfully because they are obsessive compulsive. For instance, checking, can't get out of the house because they have to check many, many times to be sure the door is locked or the stove is off. And then the other disorders, many, 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 like I said, inches thick, but we aren't gonna address those today, because those aren't the ones that are really impacting the cost to our community as much. So, who gets it? The short answer is anyone and everyone. It is an equal opportunist, and um, it likes rich people, it likes poor people, it likes little people, it likes big people. And there are a number of things that can make you even more likely to acquire a mental illness a genetic predisposition, brain injuries, adverse childhood experiences, and life its situations. So, how big a problem is this? 
One out of every 17 people here in Whatcom County have a mental illness. And that means about one in every five families is affected. Raise your hand if you know somebody who you think may have a mental illness and look around. Are we close to one in five families? Yeah, 17? Yeah. Children versus adults. 21% of children are diagnosed with a mental illness here in Whatcom County. Five to nine have a serious emotional disturbance. And they call it that um, to be more uh, politically correct, more sensitive to the fact that many children can be adequately and successfully treated when they're children and not carry a mental illness into adulthood. Our suicide rate, um, there's another figure I, that was more like a little over 19 per 100,000. We're above the state average. The state average is around 13 out of every 100,000. So, can mental illness be cured? Well, all mental illness can be treated. The serious conditions that we are gonna talk about, or that we've talked about today, are typically not cured but can be treated successfully so that people can leave productive, healthy, and enjoyable lives. What we focus on now is a person's recovery from that mental illness, meaning keeping them stable, keeping them actively involved in their life, and resilience so that when they have a down day or a down situation, they can bounce back up and still remain functional. So, there are many different treatment options. Um, let's, this is what I wanna really focus on today. So what are the, what happens when there's no treatment? So, first of all, what we know is that people tend to use crisis services, emergency services more often. They're in the um, emergency room because of a heart attack, but actually it's not. It's a anxiety disorder have erratic behavior, a lot of criminal justice interface. Now I'm gonna give you a couple stats here that are fascinating. When we were looking in this county to figure out, do we wanna impose a one-tenth of one percent increase in our local sales tax to focus on expanding and establishing chemical dependency and mental health treatment programs? Well, let's see, well, what's the need? What we did is we looked through, um, talked with a number of folks and figured out that there were this top 12 group of people that recycled in and out of the jail. And those 12, we figured, cost approximately $722,611. 12, $722,611, I don't know how many cents. Total for all 12, aggregate in an annual basis. Of those 12, um, the average number of times that they were arrested, 32. Divided by 365. Average number of times these 12 had a county sheriff's office contact, not arrested necessarily, just to contact, 93. How many of them had a behavioral health disorder? 100%. I know, that wasn't hard to figure out, was it? All right. We also recently um, started working with the Bellingham Police Department on their top 10. So not only people that they knew on a first name basis and react, um, interacted with on a regular basis, but also were the deemed most vulnerable. And what we did, and we did this um, in connection with the Whatcom Homeless Service Center. They took the strong lead on this. Um, we not only identified those top 10, secured housing, secured services, continued the services, and what happened? The number of arrests went down, the number of days in jail went down, housing stability, they remained housed as opposed to homeless, and two of them are going to college right now. <laughs> this is just in the last year and a half or so. So, treatment works. 
And it's not just sitting down and talking to somebody and tell me about your feelings. It is a coordinated, integrated effort. Okay. Um, one other thing I forgot to point out is that of the Medicaid population, 50% of the dollars spent in health care under Medicaid are devoted to 5% of the Medicaid population. Mental illness is costly. So what have we done as a community? Well, in July of 2008, the Whatcom County Council voted to impose that one-tenth of one percent sales tax. The economy kind of tanked after that. You may have read about that. but. Um, so we thought we'd get more than three million a year, but right now we're averaging between three and 3.2 million a year. Um, what we chose to do as a community with the help of many stakeholders is first of all, pool all the resources available. Local funds, whether they're housing funds, treatment dollars, we pooled state dollars, we pooled federal dollars, we went for grants. We decided we were going to do a coordinated effort no matter what, that we weren't going to just fund little boutique programs here or there, that we were going to be really planful and strategic. And then we ensured that all of our partners were on board. And then what we did is, oh, we're not there yet, sorry, I'll talk some more. <laughs> and so what we did is established what we call a continuum of care. And we used a model called PETA, which stands for Prevention, Intervention, Treatment, Aftercare. And we said to ourselves, if somebody with a mental illness steps into our system and receives services at any point in time, this continuum will serve them until they are beginning to experience recovery. And that we didn't want a system that did really good here and then, oops, sorry, no services. Best of luck. And then, oh. You're here again, hmm, you're at another door, let's serve you again. It wasn't successful. What we find in the literature is that those with a serious chronic condition of mental illness are best served and most successful when in fact they have an integrated set of services that support it. So that's what we have done here. Now I have put in your binders a list of programs and services that we fund with our sales tax dollars. And um, I've put in contact information for our publicly funded treatment providers, both um, our mental health agencies as well as um, giving you a list of some of the supportive services offered by other agencies. And um, these are just a few of our programs. We also didn't just guess. We really made a point of looking at the research to tell us what programs are most effective. What does the research tell us will give us the most bang for our buck that will produce the greatest outcomes and thus the set of services that we provide. And then we also um, have a fund balance that we said Give us a fund balance that we can use for two things. One, capital projects. And our biggest um, one on top of the list right now is enhancing the behavioral health triage facility we have in conjunction with the new jail that we are planning. So I'm on the jail planning task force and we are very clear that we need to ensure that people in the criminal justice system that should be actually more appropriately treated in the mental health arena can get there. We also um, very recently um, added mental health courts to our list of our wish list, which we are starting to work on actively. Um, the Washington State Institute for Public Policy says you get a 44% return on your investment with a successful, effective mental health court. Um, obviously supported housing programs. Our community spends over two and a half million dollars a year on housing programs that support people living with mental illness. Huge, huge, huge commitment, which is probably why we are one of the shining stars of the state, is because the services we provide are effective because the people we provide them to have a stable housing environment. 
critical to success. Services delivered to people without housing are not as effective. Um, you may have heard Sheriff Elfo on the phone this morning. Gangs are becoming a huge issue here. So one of our other um, focuses over the next couple of years is going to be gang prevention programs directed towards kids who are very, very vulnerable to becoming part of a gang. And then um, the other big thing that's happening in our community is that opiate addiction rates are increasing. They're spiking. Unfortunately, we're like in the, we're in the top five in the state. Bad news. So we are really looking more at ways that we can expand opiate addiction treatment. Um, I see Judge Schneider here. Drug court has seen a huge increase in the amount of people addicted to opiates. Um, we're trying to build some more programs in the community to help provide a much more coordinated system of care so after an inpatient stay, they can get immediately into treatment and stay um, on the road to recovery. Um, I don't know what else I've got here. I'm running out. Okay, so that was the uh, Cliff Notes version, and I did it in the Evelyn Wood reading dynamic speed reading, right? <laughs> so I will turn it over to Dennis, and then afterwards we are very happy to answer some of your questions. Hey. Good to see you all. I don't know if I want to stand right here. I feel like I'm being questioned about a crime or something. <laughs> So I'll move around a little bit and let Ann take this, because I'm a long ways away from all of you, and I only have a few slides to talk about. So um, and my, again, let me say that I appreciate the introduction. Thank you. And my name is Dennis Dashiel, and I'm a mental health professional here in town. And I'm on the board for Wacom Counseling and Psychiatric Clinic, so that's kind of one of the main reasons I'm here today. And Wacom Counseling is one of the agencies that's funded by what Ann was uh, talking about, and you saw the list of agencies there. Wacom Counseling is really, you know, you might say one of the very primary agencies that's really doing a lot of this work in this community. Uh, there are a lot of different angles on this. I, I love our title today, if I can remember exactly what it was, you know, is it, uh, is it, is it just good business or, or is it a social commitment that we make? And there's this conversation when we talk about good health care in, in, in general. And we really look at this as both an ethics and values conversation. How do we take care of the least fortunate among us and the people that are the most needy? But there's also, if you just want to get brass tacks and talk about cost effectiveness, didn't you hear that? I mean, you can talk cost effectiveness. I, I heard a really good factoid this morning on the radio. Did you know that Bellingham is named after William Bellingham, an accountant for the Royal Navy? Bellingham's named after an accountant. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have thought that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think the cost effectiveness is a really important piece. And part of what I want to talk about in terms of Wacom Counseling and Psychiatric Clinic is, is the, the forward thinking that our, our whole community, including this one agency as an example, is trying to do to be really thinking about where do we need to go in terms of health care reform? How do we want things to work? Uh, and I, I have this example in my own mind. It's the thing about us trying to be creative in health care. Um, I also, in one of my capacities, manage behavioral health benefits, and the guy that helps to coordinate when there's something very high acuity going on. And I made an authorization some time ago for somebody to go for eating disorders treatment. And they were probably going to die if they didn't get that treatment. And it was going to cost like $60,000 for six weeks of treatment, and, and it'd probably go beyond six weeks. For $60,000, I could hire somebody to follow that person around everywhere they went, whispering self-esteem things in their ear and helping them with diet. You know, I mean, that's a lot of money. And, and so we start saying, what can we do? If we were doing the very best we could and getting as creative as we possibly could, what could we do with the money that we spend in law enforcement and jails and, and doctors and emergency rooms? So th that's where we're going in terms of health care reform. And that's where we, as a community, I think are doing a really great job. We're forward thinking. We're trying to look at what's coming. Uh, we're not just sitting back and waiting for it to happen. There are task forces of people working through the Wacom Alliance for Healthcare Access, trying to think creatively about what would what they call an accountable care organization for our community look like in the future. And, and, and that's a place where we don't just spend money on pathology. It's a lot of health care is spending money on the diagnosis of a pathology and the treatment of an illness. And wouldn't it be great if we could take some of those resources and put it into prevention? Um, so that's really where we want to go. 
Um, and, and in particular, I know there's one study that showed that in Denmark, when they did a good job of this, they closed half the hospitals in the country. They saved that money, and they put a lot of that money into prevention and better access to primary care. Uh, and they expect that to go, it went from 150 hospitals to 71, they expect it to go to 40. Uh, Denmark. Um, it's from a, a good article called Hot Spotters, if you're looking for an article about that. Uh, so, you know, th this is a part of where we want to go. We want to be creative and forward thinking. And, and you know, I, I'm always a little bit bothered by the whole diagnosis of mental illness. You know, there, there's some great examples that are up here of what happens in worst case scenarios. But that can be kind of scary for us talking about the scary mentally ill people, right? I mean, I guarantee you I can diagnose everybody in here with something. <laughs> I guarantee it. You give me an hour interview, you got something. Yeah. <laughs> So you know, what is the continuum of mental illness? And some things at their etiology have some biochemical kind of things that are happening that may or may not be genetically linked. Other things might come from what's going on in your environment. I understand we have a lot of thyroid problems in Bellingham and Ferndale in particular. I'd be curious about where that comes from. Um, you know, so there are a lot of places where the etiologies come from, but there's also childhood experience. When we talk about people uh, being sexually abused as children, for instance, very high ratios. And you think about the, what people do to overcome that and to be resilient and go forward in their lives. So there are a lot of things that aren't necessarily the worst of the worst, but th th there are the few populations that end up eating up, as you heard with the Medicaid population, 5% of the folks on Medicaid using 50% of the resources. Uh, so this is what we talk about in terms of hot spotters and really saying, what can we do to drill down and really serve folks? So Whatcom Counseling and Psychiatric Clinic, it was founded here in Whatcom County in 1957. Uh, so an organization with a good history. And folks might know the main offices right now are on McLeod over by Squalicum High School. And we're always looking to get more of a downtown identity as well. I think we need to keep aiming for that. And, and there's a list of some of our primary programs. And it's more than folks coming in and getting individual psychotherapy, which is really important. You know, the outcome studies say if you're only going to get therapy or you're only going to take a medication, you get better outcomes from only getting therapy. So uh, counseling is a really important tool. Uh, and, and, you know, there's, there are great outcomes and great cure rates, and that's something we really want to talk about. Not everything is chronic, but there are times when a great success is that somebody only goes to the emergency room monthly instead of weekly, right? There are those moments. Uh, but there are a lot of good outcomes where people really get better and their families get better and their children have a better experience and the pay it forward cost effectiveness is amazing. And in Whatcom County, you know, we have this unique thing, right? We have the Canadian border and the mountains and the water and that nice little tree filled corridor as you come up out of Skagit. We have this very distinctive island here and we know that when we invest in prevention here, it stays in our community. You know, it's a really interesting thing that we have and it's very unique. Uh, and I think we have a lot of good, smart people trying to take advantage of that. So when you look at the program list that's up there, there are a lot of pieces. The Rainbow Recovery Center is one of the main things. that we, We're very proud of Rainbow Center. Uh, Rainbow Center is uh, currently lo located downtown as a physical space, and it's a, it's a peer-run organization where folks that are dealing with mental illness issues are there welcoming people. They have lunch. You, you talk about where resources are in the community. There are programs to help people look at employment. And it's a place that anybody can walk into and feel welcome and be a part of a community. And that really helps a lot in terms of access and folks that are, can maybe come into our community or bouncing in and out of housing things but then all of a sudden folks can say, hey, there's Rainbow Center, it's a touchstone, a place where I can be a little bit stable and have a sense of community. And we know that social supports and having a sense of community is huge for healthcare. Everybody I talk to that says, you know, if you were all alone and tried to, to go get good healthcare, it's really hard. It's important to have family members and people that understand you and friends, people that know your story that really help to follow things. Um, another program that's uh, operated in close uh, relationship to Rainbow Center is supported employment. Um, I'm hearing that that's one of the programs that unfortunately we're likely to lose funding for. Uh, there's a lot of new information coming out in terms of state budget cuts right now, and so we're kind of looking at which pieces are going to continue to be funded from a state level, and which ones we're really going to have to rely upon that one-tenth of one percent and other kinds of resources locally. Um, and one-tenth of one percent, by the way, that number is zero decimal point zero zero one, right? That, that's, that's the level that's going towards it it can make a huge difference. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful we have that. The mobile outreach team is another program that is going to go away. Uh, that's uh, where we have a peer as well as a mental health professional who can go out and meet with folks that aren't doing anything illegal or having to be put away, but somebody reaching out and saying, hey, a neighbor or somebody else was concerned about you. We want to check on how you're doing and what's going on here. 
So it's those kind of things where we reach out to folks that are hard for us to continue finding funding for. And but the county does a great job of helping us with these things. And if at any point, Ann, I talk about something, you guys, you know, I, I get the wrong picture on where things are going, you let me know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. We, um, we have support, but no technology. So yeah. <laughs> we actually, the mobile outreach team is a service that we have talked about modifying. So now that Medicaid dollars won't go into it, if we use local resources. Um, but I can talk more about programs later. But yeah. yeah. Right. So examples. That's not and I don't want to spend gone. too much time on every single program. So let me just kind of run through, obviously, child outpatient services are provided. Children and families can come in and get counseling services and advice and parenting and all those kind of pieces. And certainly Catholic Community Services is one of the bigger agencies here in town. There's a lot of work with kids and we do that as well out of the clinic. Um, adult outpatient, that's just the, the meat and potatoes of folks coming in and getting counseling, right? Behavioral health access is the program of services that are for folks that are uninsured but also don't have Medicare or Medicaid or other kinds of insurance to pay for services but are really in need of some counseling. That is currently supported by the funds that come out of those tax dollars here in Whatcom County. Um, elder outreach, again, another program that can be, uh, has unfortunately uh, been challenged. It was currently being funded by money right here in the state. It was, it was eliminated at the state level and it was kept on board and at the RSN level it was kept on board at our county. So that's where you reach out to folks who are elderly in their homes who don't necessarily have a diagnosis. Because how do you bill an insurance company if you don't have a diagnosis, right? You aren't doing a biopsychosocial intake form and creating a medical chart. You know, how do you bill if you don't do that? And it's tricky under our current model. I hope healthcare reform will help us with that. But this is a program where we reach out to folks when somebody says, hey, I'm really worried about them. These are the kind of phone calls I get all the time from the people that know me, you know, my friends and family. They'll call up and say, I'm really worried about mom or grandma or grandpa, and they're starting to do some funny stuff, and what are our options? I mean, anybody that works in mental health gets those phone calls all the time. Um, so uh, expanded community outreach, again, reaching out to elders who are in nursing homes that are having mental illness issues that are not really within the expertise of the nursing home to take care of. Um, medical services are psychiatry you know, the prescriptive side of things, psychiatrists and psychiatric nurse practitioners. You know, we've done some studies recently and we pretty much lose money at the clinic on trying to do that service, but yet you have to figure out how to do it for people. Psychiatry is in grand um, shortage right now in the United States and in Washington State. It's not easy to get in to see psychiatrists. So this is an important piece of what the clinic does. Uh, and unfortunately, we, you know, it's something that's hard to find the proper reimbursement for, but it's something th people have access to through the clinic. And I want folks here to understand that people can use our community. It's the community mental health clinic. You don't have to be chronically mentally ill to use our community mental health clinic. That's an important message for everybody to take away today. Um, the, the next program, Offender Reentry Counseling, it, um, they renamed that. It used to be called Dangerous Mentally Ill Offender Program. I wonder why they renamed that. Um, <laughs> um, folks coming out of jail who, who, and, and other kind of lockup kind of dynamics where there needs to be somebody tracking what's going on for them. And so again, this is something that uh, looks to be taken care of at our local level and not necessarily at the state level. We're again looking at the state discontinue its ability to support a lot of things. Jail psychiatry, I think that speaks for itself, reaching out to jail, making sure that if they need help psychiatrically in terms of medications and also jail mental health treatment, uh, counseling, et cetera, because a lot of folks end up bouncing into the jails. And, you know, I, I joke with people a lot that there are things you do wrong that land you in a psych hospital and things that do wrong that you in jail. Um, you know, it's important not to put everything in a mental health category. Some things are just bad behavior. But, um, you know, when it is mental illness that's driving the problems, I think it's important we get behind it. Crisis outreach is really important. So these are what are called designated mental health professionals. Um, these are the people that are available 24 hours a day to go maybe to the emergency room or other places and do an assessment if somebody needs to be hospitalized, maybe against their will, right? And there are those moments when if somebody's what we call gravely disabled, it means they really can't keep themselves out of traffic or you know don't know not to eat poison, or if they're suicidal or homicidal. So those are the specific things where we have to assess and make sure somebody gets help whether they like it or not. Uh, and those folks are operated by Wacom Counseling and Psychiatric Clinic. Um, and, and of course, there's the crisis outreach component of that. You don't just commit people. You go and reach out to them and figure out what's going on with their crisis and what we can do to help stabilize things for them. 
Uh, the Crisis Respite Program is currently combined as part of our Crisis Triage Center. It's over in the uh, Iron Gate District. And uh, folks can be there and have a place to be that's monitored and be with other folks and have that kind of sense of support but without necessarily being in the hospital. And the, the clinic is trying to really enhance and beef that up because it's, it's a resource that th we see that we could have people go there and get stabilized and get good care rather than having something that goes through an emergency room. Emergency rooms are very expensive care. And if we can find other ways to do things, it works much better. Uh, so we're trying to really keep that growing, and that's an, a big piece of what the priorities are for in the county as well. Uh, the court liaison program is reaching out and helping to do the testimony that's necessary in court as mental health professionals when there are commitment hearings and whatnot. Um, the PATH program, homeless outreach, so tr out there in the community, thinking about the gentleman who cut his uh, arm off, for instance, unfortunately, wasn't somebody that we were talking to, but trying to figure out how do we how do we make sure we're making that presence and reaching out to folks and, and bringing people back in and reintegrating. Um, and then uh, adult intensive outpatient, again, transition out of hospitals and other kinds of situations. Open access, walk-in availability is something we are very proud of. So we have folks at this point now, walk-in counseling and psychiatric clinic during regular business hours, you can walk in the front door without an appointment you don't have to have health insurance, or you can have Medicare, or you can have Medicaid, or you can have Regents, or group health, or, and, and you will be able to be seen. And you don't even have to have an appointment. It's a pretty amazing dynamic. They've really spent a lot of time putting this together. They have folks available, rotating through, able to do the intakes, able to hook up and do the social work to find the resources, to make resources available to that person. It, it, it's, I don't know of another community right now that has walk-in availability like we've put together here. So it's a pretty amazing thing that Whatcom Counseling and Psychiatric Clinic is doing right now. And obviously there are moments when they don't get reimbursed for something that's going on. That's not easy every single time. So that's part of the commitment that the clinic makes. And then finally we start getting into the things we're looking forward with even more. We're working on primary care integration, trying to get uh, mental health professionals. We're doing some pilot projects right now and we hope to really be doing more and more of co-locating our mental health professionals out in the primary care settings. So when you go to the Ferndale Family Care Clinic, for instance, and your doctor says, you know, I'm a little bit worried about seasonal affective stuff or whether it's stress. Would you mind meeting with this counselor that I, works down the hall with me and just let, let them take a look at this with me and make sure we're getting the right kind of picture of what's going on. Uh, and we hope to be able to do that more and more, a lot more of the primary care settings all around Whatcom County. And we're looking to try to maybe bring primary care into Whatcom Counseling and Psychiatric Clinic itself because we are a medical home for so many folks that come to the clinic. It's the place where they're feeling comfortable, where they know that they're welcome, where they know that there's a system that to what's happening for them. So in integrating primary care back and forth. Remember that number, 25 years younger, the, uh, the, the uh, mortality. Uh, for people with chronic uh, and serious mental illness. So, here we are. We have, I have a couple of success. What time to wrap up? I'm going to make sure I got my head on it. Three more minutes. Oh, five more minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Two. So, um, th these are two success stories that were passed along to me from clinicians at the clinic that I wanted to be able to talk about. The first one here was a young mother, a woman in her 30s, who um, seemed that she had bipolar disorder, but she wanted help managing what was going on for her, and she wanted to do it without medication. She had a toddler she was taking care of, and she, she and her husband wanted to be able to have another baby and really thought maybe medication wasn't something she wanted to do right then, but she hadn't sought, ser sought services before. So 10 years of cycles of rage and debilitating depression, but she came in and got help, insight-oriented psychotherapy, looking at history and what happened earlier in her life and things that really kind of gave her more insight into where this is coming from in her. Also a thing called DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy Skills. This is about mindfulness, teaching people to be self-aware when we're emotionally dysregulated. How do you know, hey, I'm stressed out right now. You know, I'm not very good at that. My wife will look at me and say, you're grumpy. I say, no, I'm not. You know, I, I, I never admit it the first time. Uh, but, you know, we teach people to be self-aware when they're stressed out and depressed and then to think about what are healthy, sustainable, self-soothing coping mechanisms. And you'd be surprised how many people don't have self-awareness that something's wrong with where they're at emotionally at a given moment and really don't have that sense of self-soothing. If you were never offered that, for instance, 
in your childhood, maybe? How would you know later on, hey, you know what, I could sit down and wrap up in a warm blanket and have a cup of cocoa and maybe I'll feel better. Uh, and sometimes people just don't kind of move to that. So this kind of instruction actually has some excellent outcomes to try and teach people self-awareness and simple things to help take care of themselves. DBT gets much more involved in that, but I think that's a br broad overview of it. Anyway, this person through that insight oriented and skills training was actually able to alter her cycles for the first time in 10 years. Uh, she's on the road to recovery. Uh, she was able to get pregnant with a second child and is working and really found for the first time in a decade that she was able to start managing this cycle of kind of rage and debilitating depression. Uh, and, and, and that's through that skills training and insight development. So having people have that kind of resource available. And you hope you can get it sometimes from wise friends and family members, but you can't always get that that way. And it's important to have these resources. If I can get the next example. Um, this one is an example of something that was, and I know you can't read all the fine print there, but uh, a 30 something year old woman with uh, mental health, chemical dependency, and medical issues. I mean, the list of diagnoses is pretty thick. Schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type, po polysubstance dependence, ADD, borderline personality disorder, diabetes, type two, insulin dependent, hypertension, hyperthyroidism, and hyperlipidemia. Um, so we, remember we were talking about cost effectiveness and what we're trying to do, and, and not to mention, of course, the suffering that this person was dealing with. Um, uh, frequent police encounters, emergency room, uh, the person's active drug of choice was heroin, and you heard said earlier, most people don't realize this, we are right now having really an explosion of opioid problems in Whatcom County, so it's a big deal. Um, and so this person uh, was on the verge of becoming homeless and being kicked out of housing, um, illegal drug use, blood sugar, uh, missing most PCP appointments. You can imagine this person trying to get to scheduled appointments at their primary care doctor's office. It wasn't happening. Um, emergency room frequently. Um, I don't know what the numbers are and costs for this person when they were out of control, but you can imagine what those costs probably were adding up to on a regular basis. So the services that were provided are a nurse care manager who could educate the person about uh, all the different kinds of illnesses that were going on there coordinate with the primary care physician, um, and uh, then work with the case manager. So we have somebody then who's able to go and be available 24-7. This person needed to call and say, hey, I'm starting to kind of flip out a little bit here. You say, okay, well, let's talk about what you can do to self-soothe right now. And it, being available, that access to immediate care rather than having to go to an emergency room was a big help for this person. So, and help them move closer to their, this person, they, they helped them move closer to their mom. That was important, having that social support. So they moved where they were living. And, this, and they got accompanied when they went to their primary care doctor's office to help make sure that that appointment happened smoothly and that all the right things were talked about. And finally, there's a psychiatric nurse practitioner who did the prescribing, who was able to increase compliance by setting up weekly med sets and things like that. And that kind of coordination got to this person where the outcomes, and it's interesting, but ER visits and hospital admissions decreased significantly. Didn't go away entirely, decreased. Um, the client is keeping PC, their primary care appointments, um, they're working now, instead of with the intensive program, with a regular case manager. They're using public transit, and in the last five months had only had one relapse, which sometimes relapse is part of recovery, as they say. It's a good phrase. Um, so you can see, you know, in Whatcom County, I've already noted, we're well coordinated, we're forward thinking. We have a consistent population that can benefit from, from prevention. Um, and, and I think our geographically distinct boundaries lend us some sense of identity that really helps us. And again, I, good behavioral health care is both a social duty and it's good business. I think both pieces are going on and anything we can do to advocate um, for folks to kind of keep an awareness of this. Y did you know that there was some fear that this might be sparsely attended because people think this is a scary topic? Yeah. <laughs> there was some fear of that. And uh, I think sometimes people don't necessarily want to think about these kind of issues, but it can affect all of us at different points in our lives. Uh, so I, I hope you'll continue to think about this in terms of a public advocacy level and also support of our local clinics in whatever way you can. Um, as a ratio of spending on health care, mental health gets a higher ratio at a very local level compared to all the other types of health care. As you go further away to the state, it goes down compared to how much we spend at a local level. If you go to the federal level, it goes down compared to how much they spend at the state level. So your advocacy for what happens right here at the local level makes a big difference and pays immediately in terms of our community. So I, I think it's quality of life for all of us. I appreciate all your time, and I think we're going to take questions, right?
now's the time for our members to ask questions of the panelists. Uh, very thoughtful presentation. We have Skip Williams and Harriet okay. Spinell in the room. So please raise your hand when I you have, have one a here. question. Okay, Harriet, we'll go first. Uh, first, a uh, uh, reflection or comment, and then secondly, a question. Uh, first, the comment. Uh, I have to take exception to the introduction of this session because by using such vivid, violent examples of the mentally ill, we demonize them, and that then leads to incarceration as the cure. So I don't like that at all. I much prefer your presentation about preventive care and more professional care. Second question, uh, you talked about the increase in opioids and opioid uh, addictions coming. I was listening to a program the other day that had uh, indicated that one of the causalities of the increase in opioids is sleeplessness increasing in the population and that these opioids were often prescribed medicine by medical professionals. If that's true, what's leading to an increase of sleeplessness in our general population? Any clues? So, first of all, um, I don't think the research um, will bear that out yet. So, we'll assume it's a theory, but not a fact. And I think what we know in terms of the research on sleeplessness is that in America, technology has um, hit the zero to 60 speed limit very rapidly. And that what we know, for instance, is somebody who is on a computer or a Game Boy or something else um, can't get to sleep. Their brain is activated and they can't sleep well afterwards. That you need at least two hours of downtime between the time you use an electronic um, piece of equipment and the time you go to sleep, just for instance. So there's many reasons. Technology has added a lot of stress to our lives, which makes it very difficult to get to sleep. And I think I laid awake last night thinking about a number of things. So, And I don't use opiates. So. But yeah, opiates are a huge problem everywhere um, in Washington State. And, and I could say a few things about that real quickly, if I could, too. I think I like standing. I can see over this table better. Um, so, I mean, we, we are seeing a lot more opioid addictions going on right now, and there are a lot of reasons for that. I'm, I'm always shocked at how much Percocet, uh, 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 um, Oxycontin and things like that is available on the street. Isn't this made by pharmaceutical companies? How does that get on giant baggies on the street? Um, but, uh, and I think, I think what I've heard is it goes for about a dollar a milligram, right? So 60 milligram tablets, 60 bucks, so, you know, depending on what you're It's expensive stuff. People spend a lot of money when they're addicted and buying this on the street. But a whole lot of our population is getting it from their primary care doctors too. And it's, it's a struggle because somebody has pain and they say I'm in pain and that's a subjective thing to try and manage and figure out with them. And, and trying to get people to the other side of that, I do agree that I think technology and awareness that we actually need a certain amount of sleep, I, I, I blame it on technology. But I want to say something sleep. good, Dennis. <laughs> yeah. So one of the other programs, uh, there are so many programs I didn't talk about today and I'm willing to stay after that we are initiating. One of the ones that we're doing right now is working with the Wacom Medical Society on pain management issues. and bringing in some training for our local physicians on how to manage pain, um, which hopefully will address the overprescription of opiates, which when somebody's in your office in pain, you want to provide palliative care. But, so. Absolutely. OK, yeah, question over here. Hi, uh, thanks. It was a very good presentation, and I I'm, I'm feel grateful that Whatcom County has so many resources available. My question has to do with, um, we've been, fighting a couple of wars for about 10 years and a whole bunch of uh, veterans are about to be um, released into the general population. I am very concerned that given some of the experiences that they've had in the Middle East that um, we replicate what happened to some of the vets that came back from Vietnam. Um, already there's evidence of a lot of mental Ill, uh, un unaddressed mental illness, inadequate veterans administration resources, and veteran homelessness. How well equipped are we in Whatcom County to deal with returning vets who will be coming in significant numbers, not uh, in pretty short order? I am so glad you asked that question. He is not a plant, but Whatcom County um, actually was invited to a um, statewide meeting with the National Housing Advisory Committee for Veterans Affairs because we are doing such great things. So what we have done, first of all, I put this brochure in your binder. Um, 
Whatcom County oversees the Veterans Assistance Program. Last year and this year, we provided $150,000 per year out of our Veterans Assistance Funds to housing homeless veterans. We have made a significant amount of progress, significant, about half already have been housed. Um, we also provide um, not only financial assistance, support, case management, but we also provide treatment. And I will bring your attention to this folder. This is the Behavioral Health Access Program. Um, I actually wanted to name it Behavioral Health Access Program Promoting Yourself, because then it would be Be Happy. But <laughs> people made fun of me, so it's just Be Happy for short. This, um, Waha is one of our great partners. Um, anyone that you know that you think has some problems that might be helped with some counseling, this is a significant resource supported by our county dollars. And Waha will hook them up with a counselor of their choosing, I mean, that, who is part of our network, but uh, hopefully close to where they live. Um, it's free for those who are above 150% of the poverty level, up to 250%, there's a slight copay. And um, we also can even provide psychiatric services. So this is huge, and our veterans are also using this. So thank you so much for asking that. The Whatcom County Government Human Services Division oversees the veterans programs and works very closely with our locals. And, and just a quick clinical comment on that as well. What was that? I, very quickly, just to say, you know, I did my graduate work with the VA hospital in Walla Walla working with the PTSD vets. Most back then, this thing goes in and out. Um, and really, our, our awareness of how to treat anxiety and post traumatic stress disorders has increased dramatically since the Vietnam era. And I really want folks to understand we've gotten better at that. Uh, we, have, we have different kinds of tools EMDR and anxiety reducing things, understanding how to work with dreams. The VA has systems set up now that didn't exist in the Vietnam era. So I want folks to realize there's more that might be available. Uh, incident on the street in Fairhaven in a restaurant is where it started. A young woman uh, yanked her child, started to beat it. There were two men who tried to bring her down. And she knocked me over in the restaurant and I didn't know she was obviously mentally disturbed. Uh, do we call the police, or and then they take care of it, or do we keep these numbers programmed in our phones and call you for help? I was afraid to call the yes. police because I thought the appearance of a police car could set her off and make her run away, and I didn't know what to do. Great question. So I'll tell you what the county's position is on that. What we would say is, uh, defer to the professionals sooner rather than later. The um, local police department, our Whatcom County Sheriff, um, our local um, jurisdictions, we have provided training for them um, through some of these dollars for how to manage people like that. They do know how to come out and de-escalate a situation as opposed to escalate it. So rely on them. Always call 911. Um, especially when a crime is in the process of occurring. And, and when somebody spanks their child, we don't consider that a crime in our country. When they beat a child, that's a crime. And, and I just want to reiterate, the police are great at managing these kind of things. Some very skilled people here in Whatcom County. And let me say too, in terms of um, de-escalation of violence, Violence in the workplace, violence in the community. You tend to think, is it power and control? In which case, authority showing up is important. Is it mental illness? In which case, authority showing up is important. Is it some kind of practiced kind of, uh, maybe, it, maybe not practiced, but a fear that needs to be de-escalated? Sometimes you can soothe people, right? That's the one category where people try to soothe. But if you see that kind of violence going on, you need to get people that are ready to physically manage the situation. I'm glad you didn't get hurt getting knocked down, by the way. OK.
seen a problem in hospitals that I, I noticed with both of my parents at different times. Their psychiatric medications were discontinued on their admission to the hospital, and the longer they're in the hospital, the worse their behavior became. I've spoken with nurses about this who say this is very traditional. Uh, a nursing home administrator said, oh yeah, we always knew when our patients went to the hospital, it would take two weeks to get them back to normal when we got them back in the, in the rest home. It, is that that would not that be a standard best practice. No. I can just <laughs> tell you that. Just, that's the short answer. Don't advocate for your loved ones if that's occurring, and coordination of care between care providers is critical. And, uh, over here. As, well, as, and as a side note, um, depression is undertreated in the elder population. So yeah, there might be some sense that people are trying to catch and treat depression when they have some access to look at it. Uh, but again, you get better outcomes from counseling than you do just medication. So different ways to go about things. I feel a little behind the times. I recall a couple of years ago that the inpatient behavioral health unit at St. Joseph Hospital was closed. Can you give us an update on what um, the options are for inpatient mental health in the county? The um, inpatient mental health, there is still a unit at Peace Health Hospital for that. They did close down their inpatient chemical dependency treatment program. So we still have inpatient mental health here, both voluntary and involuntary. And, and more beds were added, actually. It's gotten bigger. And it was moved to the main campus near the emergency room. So it's not at the south campus in the old St. Luke's building anymore. We do miss having inpatient chemical dependency treatment available in Whatcom County, though we don't have that anymore. Okay, any further questions? I used to have very serious problems in dealing with other people because I was diagnosed with a mental illness when I was 25. That was well over 20 years ago. Because of the help that I've received, not only with meds, with counseling, but also with the DBT program and also helping out with Rainbow Recovery Center, of which I'm also, which I'm now an employee, um, I believe that I've become more stable. I've become much more independent than I used to be. And it's made quite a difference. And working there, I've noticed the difference in so many people who come through the center, many of whom may not have had homes for years, have their first home in a long time. Some may have had their first jobs in a long time. Others may have the treatment for drug and alcohol abuse for the first time. I know, I know it's really easy to assume, oh, well, all mentally ill people are such and such. But we can tell you this. It is treatable, and we do survive. Great story. Thank you. I want to tell you something else about Mr. Sapienza. Mr. Sapienza actually served as chair of our Mental Health Advisory Board locally for a number of years, and thank you so much for your service. I Dennis, I know you because um, uh, I work as a nurse's delegate, and we get um, the employment, employment assistant program. Are you still doing that? Oh, I am, yep. yeah. And he's given me some really good advice, so um, it's kind of like support for health professionals. Um, I think in, in the end, all of our hearts are wanting to go in the direction of mental health regain. And um, I have done a lot of research on centers in um, America and elsewhere that are actually like spas where people can go, yes. Um, does Whatcom County want to be a magnet for a wellness center? Because there are wellness centers out there that coordinate, as you were talking about, primary care with uh, mental health, health counseling, but they also do the full battery of gastrointestinal, thyroid tests, et cetera, because a lot of mental health issues are really biochemical imbalances, okay? So I was wondering if, if, if we're looking there, because it's not in Washington State. It's, you know, there's the Health Recovery Center in Minneapolis that does the alcohol and the drug, legal and illegal, and actually doesn't have recidivism rates. There's one in Hawaii, there's one in California. Um, right across uh, the border of British Columbia. So are we willing to kind of, you know, move it up? We're a rogue nation, risk, dare, dream. Are we willing to move it into the corridor of, of, of moving the money here? And, and starting a wellness center that, that could really get here? 
So let me just answer that broadly, and we can talk afterwards, too, if you like. But what I will tell you is this, that Whatcom County, through um, various efforts, are stridently working toward health care reform and positioning ourselves in a pos place where we can deliver effective services in a comprehensive way to people with all types of illness, understanding that those with mental illness are significantly more at risk for medical issues as well. So we are already doing that work. Um, we're um, ahead of the state in many areas in that work, and it, it is clearly a strong value of ours. And so, oh, and I would just say, you know, that's I've talked to other folks as we were getting ready, even today, that were elsewhere in the audience who were saying, boy, sometimes we don't understand the etiology of where these mental health symptoms are coming from, and we jump right to thinking it's all a mental health diagnosis and then we find out somebody has a low thyroid or we find that they're allergic to gluten or we you know there's a lot of we can do at other biomedical levels and with better coordination I have great hopes for healthcare reform to tie us together and be communicating a lot better and Bellingham was known for being creative about how we do healthcare we think about naturopathic medicine and other kinds of things a lot more here than in some other parts of the world so I, I hope that we'll be able to integrate more and more of that in healthcare reform so I just want to let you know that I have more brochures. Please come up if you've got folks that you think would benefit. I brought them particularly for you to hand out. And if you have other friends, um, family that you think need more of the comprehensive packet, there's a few more here. And I brought extra because I want you to take them. I want you to use the resources that your community is supporting and your tax dollars are supporting. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Now's the time for us. Well, I guess that was it. Uh, thanking our two guests. They did a marvelous job, and we're awfully glad you came. And as a token of our appreciation, we have a lovely book for you, Walk in Places 2, and we hope you enjoy it. So thank you very much. And we'll see you next month.